Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Hey, engagers, and today we have somebody quite special from Sweden, and his name is Jan Bittner. And Jan, are you prepared to engage? Always, Rob. I'm always prepared to engage. <laughs> so Jan is a gamification designer and UX, that's user experience strategist, and has worked as a consultant in the IT industry for over 15 years. He has been an advocate for storytelling, game design, thinking, game design thinking, and user-centered design even longer than that. He has a background in acting and teaching drama, and he always brings a bit of playfulness into everything that he does. Lately, he has also been working a lot with the digital workspace, UX, and change management. Very, very interesting. He has found uh, gamification angles in each project that requires long-term strategies, user engagement, and behavior change, which is pretty much what every implementation project requires. He is also very passionate about schools and learning and works part-time as a hospital clown. That's an interesting angle and brings, again, the fun that we're trying to achieve pretty often. He is active within the gamification community and also one of the founders of the Swedish podcast. Okay, I'm going to do this terribly wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> Give it a shot. Bro. <laughs> gamification Fredag. Uh, yeah, you yeah. can watch also his fresh mini vlog, that's video log series, about gamification in Swedish, Gamification Skolan, that runs in December. So correct me with any terrible pronunciation, Jan. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Friadag means Friday, so Gamification Friday in uh, any other language. And uh, Gamification Skolan means, means uh, Gamification School, actually. Fantastic. Great translation so that we are able to understand if we're not Swedish. <laughs> yeah. So, Jan, uh, is there anything we missed from that intro? Uh, absolutely nothing. You covered it all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's take a look at what does a, a regular day uh, with Jan look like? Oh, pff, to be honest, regular days are, are pretty rare. It feels like every day is a non-regular. And also, I, I sort of end up reinventing the wheel over and over again, for better or for worse. Uh, and that is uh, mostly because I'm bored. I get bored with things. But also because I, try to st I strive to find the best suitable solution for every unique problem. I am uh, sort of what you might call a why guy. <laughs> I kind of like the, the toddler strategy. Did you hear about it? The toddler strategy, the, the, yeah, the kids. The toddler, okay. you, yeah, you know, the toddler, they keep asking why all the time. Why, why do we have to eat? Because it's good for you. Why is it good for us? You know, and you keep uh, digging down to the bone, to the core. Of course, you have to stop somewhere because otherwise it gets too existential. But, but working with clients, I, I think why is a, is a really good strategy. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, yeah. In, in general, maybe not a, a regular day, maybe a regular week or even a regular month. What does your, what we want to get a feel of is a sense of how your life works in, in, in that yeah, sense yeah. in the gamification space. But could we do a, a sort of an optimal, an ideal day instead? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, pretend that you're waking up early, fully rested. It doesn't happen, happen, it doesn't happen very often, but um, that, that's the way I, I would like to see my ideal days. I woke up wake up early and I have a long breakfast and reading up on stuff, mostly articles about news, uh, articles or news about gamification, design and UX, uh, stuff that sort of makes me think and maybe inject me with new ideas about stuff, maybe to write and to investigate or to implement in things that I'm doing. And, and then if I'm lucky, I, maybe I spend a couple of hours designing concepts, writing, analyzing or maybe for a client and then having a few calls with colleagues, current or potential clients, uh, having lunch and then my, maybe biking off to, to the office and uh, maybe pondering some challenging and creative problems and hatching different solution ideas and stuff like that. 
And and uh, you know tomorrow is my last day with my current current employers, so uh, there will be a completely new set of regular days after tomorrow. And uh, in the afternoons, I might be working um, working at the office, uh, having meetings, prepping presentations is something I do a lot and tweaking them, maybe reading something more, and hopefully start writing a blog post or something. And and I usually end end the day by going to the gym or as my to my second job as a hospital clown. Cool. That sounds very cool. What uh, can you give us a, a brief, very very brief explanation of what do you do as a as a hospital clown? As a hospital clown, I work at uh, what do you call it? Uh, a department, a ward, no? Yes. For kids. Mm-hmm. A department for kids where where they uh, they uh, have kids with cancer. So I, I meet them one week, one day a week. Every Monday I go there and uh, work with uh, some some colleagues and meeting the clowns. And you go around to the to the kids and meet them in their own private space in their rooms. And and it's uh, it's not like a circus clown. It's more like you know like a, a friendly clown that comes along and sings some songs and asks some questions and blow bubbles and and listen to the kids. It's sort of a relief from the everyday stress at the, the hospital. So it's it's a pretty nice uh, moment meeting the kids. Definitely, definitely. That's that sounds fantastic. Thank you for for such a phenomenal thing that that you do. Again, whether it's voluntary or not, I think it's a it's a fantastic thing to do because those kids are certainly going yeah. to be. Maybe not their whole lives is going to change, but those moments are, are definitely changing the way that they perceive their everyday. Yeah, and there are, as you said, parallels to what we are doing. I mean, listening to people and finding out their their sweet spots and and uh, trying to amuse them because uh, laughter and uh, joy uh, always adds an extra dimension to both the work and to to everyday life. So, Jan, we're gonna we're gonna change a little bit the subject here, and we're going to go into what we like to call our favorite fail or our favorite failure moment. Fail as in first attempt in learning. Yeah. Um, what would you say is, is is a moment like that one? A moment where you you know something didn't work as you expected, or or it did a complete turn and and you didn't didn't work out. And then how did you? What did you learn? And or how did you get out of that situation? Yeah, and this is a bit tricky. Uh, most of my life as a consultant, I have I've been working with the non gamification projects, and most of my hard learnings are from those one, and I try not to repeat them with gamification projects. But I have some some nice learnings I, I would like to share. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, and I think the times when I failed the most, or when I I found myself in a situation where where the projects didn't work that well was the times when I failed to manage clients' expectations. I mean, sometimes uh, there's a lack of communication or like wishful readings or expectations from the client, things that sort of are outspoken and the client were just taking things for, uh, for granted or expect the solutions to behave or perform just like Facebook without having a budget like Facebook. And, and I recall this specific time when I ran a project where we didn't have full access to uh, product or business owners. I mean, if management aren't on board, there's a, there's a probable risk of failure. You're always dependent on management buy-in, as you know, uh, preferably by being an in- integral part of the project, but at least as someone with whom you can share your insights about what we are doing and having him or her making decisions about directions in the project, you know. Okay. But So what happened to me in this project was that my contact, uh, I mean, the, the sort of a proxy project manager on the client side, ended up being someone who filtered information and, and turned out having a completely different agenda than the team. Uh, we were working as a team and... And, and he basically didn't really understand either what we were doing. And one time when we were doing a demo with the product owner on the client side, his boss, uh, the processor suddenly just, the process owner just interrupted us and, and turned to this project manager, pro- proxy guy and said, wait, 
I told you earlier, you can't store documents in SharePoint, didn't I? And that was that. It was quite devastating for, for him to see him vaporized in front of us. Because we had been prototyping the solution for, uh, for a long time. And uh, I mean, 75% of it was completely dependent on the fact that we were going to store the documents in SharePoint. And of course, I take part of the blame for that. And this, uh, this wasn't the last time we ended up in predicaments like this in that spe specific project. So, and, and since then, Rob, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was going to ask you, like, uh, that, that seems like a very low point. And I, I wanted to know yeah. what, first off, of course, I'm sure you, you, were ma you managed to get out of the, of the low, low point. But then what would you, if you approach exactly that same project, knowing that these things could happen, what would you do different from the get-go to, to maybe prevent or reduce the, the, the problems that this could bring? I mean, since then, I, I never let anyone filter my communication with the product, product or process owners. Uh, these days, I get, I get almost square and stubborn about this specific point. I mean, manage expectations is my number one takeaway from this experience. But I need to make sure the product owners are on board. Also that, I mean, I, I, after this experience, I am always very keen on visualizing everything as a part of the ideation phase. And I also try to read between the lines and detect sort of expectations from process owners, owners and management. Uh, and I, I try really hard to get everything outspoken and signed off on or set clear limits for, for things so, so that everyone is aware what we are doing and where we are heading and the vision and everything. So, <laughs> I mean, the, managing expectations, I think, is, uh, is uh, really important and communications can be really tricky. I think that is the, the biggest takeaway from that, from that uh, learning experience. I'm guessing here as well that it's not only about the product owner, but you could almost generalize it to, to your stakeholders, the people who are actually yeah, making the sure. the final decisions. And and again, the, there's many contexts for that. When it's a client, as, as Jan is saying, uh, it's clearly the person who's going to make the final decision or the person who's holding any roadblocks. Uh, if your solution includes technology, you have to talk to the people in technology yeah. because it's it's not only what the boss says, it's it's also what's possible and within their budget and their systems, etc. So those stakeholders are, are really, really important. And that could be the, the IT person in your school. That could be the principal if he could be stopping or, or letting you pass a certain initiative. It could be, I don't know, the academic director if you are in a university or in a master's degree. There's many forms that that person could take, but I think it's a very key learning to really understand what's the, the, the final outcome and what are the things that are possible and not possible as well in whatever project you, you encounter. So thanks for that that story, Jan. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think visualizing is the is the key to get everyone on board, every stakeholder, as you as you mentioned. Absolutely, absolutely. And the next thing that we would like to know, Jan, is is changing exactly that almost 180 degrees instead of going for a low point where you had to get out of that low point. We'd like to know of, of some things, maybe some projects, some situation in which you, you achieved something that you would actually say you're proud of or, or a big success that you had in, in gamification. Yeah, sure. One of the things I'm uh, most uh, proud of uh, and most uh, and was the most fun and creative challenge in, in this field was when I ended up designing a tabletop game for managers in uh, in the area of uh, hospital and uh, hospital care uh, for managers in hospital satellites up in in the north of Sweden actually. So so this project was about attitude change towards uh, distance care and distance care technology in in specific. The problem we were uh, trying to address was skepticism among the managers at those hospital satellites in the inlands of North Sweden. And uh, although technology for distance care is really developed and there are great knowledge and support for it here. I live in Umeå, which is a pretty big city in Sweden by Swedish standards anyway. And this is sort of a center for hospital care within the, this part of the north region of Sweden. And uh, it's, it's, there are great knowledge and support. But there was a great uh, skepticism among those uh, managers anyway. 
which uh, was uh, based on fear of dehumanizing care and technology failure, and also from own bad experience, and also of tradition and fear of the unknown and change. So when I did this pre-study, the input from the client was either we, we think we would like to do like a simulation kind of game like The Sims or, or maybe even a board game. And, and though we, we ended up with the solution with zero percent digital digital tools in it, it was kind of perfect for the context. Uh, the managers of those hospital satellites met once a quarter for a for conference day where they always did some kind of uh, learning experience like lean, if you heard about lean, Toyota, they do lean, lean management exercises. Yes. Where they have to, they had these uh, teachers like game masters in this context where they they were calling shots and facil- facilitating this lean management exercise, almost like uh, it was a game. So uh, from from this context, we thought that uh, a Euro game sort of uh, solution would be a perfect fit. You know, managers playing a strategy game with resource handling and and addressing that actual context of should we hire another doctor or should we maybe use technology for distance care and uh, it was a great conversation starter and in my opinion it, it was a perfect solution for that context so and we also we had the luxury of having the clients involved in this process as i said management involvement evolve, involvement is really crucial in these pro- projects because uh, they started out with this huge idea about making a Sims game, and and we were we were lucky enough to be able to do this pre-study to to uh, elaborate the context, and we found this I think perfect solution for that. I think that's a that's a fantastic story, especially because it, you're even though you're you seem to be quite a technologist, you realize that not always it has to include technology, and and you were able to flip the coin and say, well, you know what. In this case, we can do it without technology, and it could grow. It could work great as well. Yeah, and uh, I, I did this with my. I had a solo company at that time, and hire, I could hire who, whoever I like to to do this project. So I had a lead designer who, who was an experienced game designer. I had an illustrator, and us three worked really together, re- real tight with the client. And it's. I think it's still in use today, nearly four years later. So it's. It's. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Can Can you tell us what what the the, the game the game board was was about? What the the whole theme was, or or how in general how they work? Uh, yeah, it was sort of. Did you ever play a board game called Stone Age with the resource handling, and you have to manage your your uh, your farm or um, having more wood and more fish and everything like that? Okay. Sort of like a settlers of settlers of Catan is sort sort of a resource handling game as well. But but this was in the context of as I said hospital care and distance care technology. So you could play as uh, you run a small hospital satellite, <laughs> uh, which you uh, you hired staff. Uh, you you could uh, you get these uh, staff cards with employees. One is a doctor, one is a nurse, and and then you also get to get uh, get to you get a budget, and you can buy a distance care technology or uh, hiring people. And your choices made the the, the strategy for how many. The main objective was to treat as many people as possible with the resources at hand. So that was the, the that was the challenge. And as they as they used uh, different strategies, they could see that, uh, of course, it was playing in the hands of what <laughs> the clients wanted to to prove, of course. But it was also a conversation starter for the managers to talk about distance technology and their fares and and stuff like that. And, and uh, if, if we're talking about failure, one of the things that we failed a bit with this game was that they were, uh, we were playing, we were doing the playing play tests with the doctors and the, and the client, the, the managers who, who were ordering this. And they were a bit, I mean, they wanted it to be super realistic, everything. 
So even though we had the, the, the possibility of maybe, maybe playing with um, how thing, things work to even start more discussions, they wanted it to be correct. Uh, so, so we ended up in sort of a, should we do more like a, a simulation of what it could be or an exact simulation of what it is? So, so that I think it could have been a better game, but it was, uh, it was a good conversation starter anyway. That's fantastic, Jan. And in that same in that same sort of spirit of of these things that we've been talking about, can you can you tell us of of whatever I don't know if you have a some sort of process when you when you when you approach one of these problems, what what do you do? Do you have a process? Do you have a series of steps? How, how do you do it? Yeah, uh, I've been thinking about that a lot about my process, and I I must say my first love when it comes to gamification and gameful design uh, was Octalysis. That was my that was my first uh, fix, you could call it. And, and also uh, Mashevsky's player types and stuff like that. And when I started off, I, 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 th- I thought that, that gamification was something completely different and magical. In, and in a way it is, because it adds the core drives and, you know, the emotional side of being a human. And, and the gameful and playful side of it. But today I tend to, to view the problem more from, from a rules and mechanics point of view. You get, I get more hardcore game design about it. Um, what is the core loop and what are the rules and mechanics in this situation? And, and even though the magic still quite hasn't worn off, and, and even if I, I tend to turn to Octalysis now and then and to the user type hexad and stuff like that, and I mean the player journey is, I, I think it's crucial to know where you are in the process. But today I tend to use the same process that I use when I take on any development or change project. I mean, the user-centered perspective is crucial, I think, in any design process. So design is the, is the main word here. And if I should try to describe it, I often start off by helping the client defining their business objectives. There is this terrific model called effect mapping or impact mapping that I use a lot. It's like a pyramid where you identify what you what you want to achieve in this business area the big why i keep asking why as i told you uh, <laughs> why are we doing this and what is the change that we want often derived and refined from from uh, any project directive you get from the client and also trying to find what the indicators are what are we going to measure how how successful we've been when we when we have done this change project? Have we been achieving the goals that we set out to do? And uh, like, uh, if the goal is, uh, for example, increased engagement, not a far off uh, goal when it comes to (laughs) to gamification, then you have to decide how to measure that. What is this engagement in this context, both before and after? Uh, You could, I mean, you could talk about how many visitors you have or how many that does this specific action in a site and then then you identify who you assume are going to be the uh, or produce these effects the i mean the target group or groups that you should engage with and that should engage with your service more and create the effects and then you define what you think they need to be able to do to create these effects and lastly you decide how you're going to support that by creating those new engaging features and game mechanics and dynamics and whatever you need to drive their engagement. So what's different then when we apply the game thinking perspective to this? Not much, I would say, <laughs> except, <laughs> except that maybe we, we let ourselves think of the users as players with a range of different possible moves and incentives to act. I mean, I, I see the player as more active as, than a user. Than an, so that is what, what my concept of a player that differs from users. And also, we think about the core drives when we design and about relevant applicable uh, game mechanics or dynamics. And also, we, we might look at our service in terms of a game concept. What are the playable parts and what do we need to remodel? What are the rules that and we need to create or, I mean, strengthen in maybe there are rules already that we need to sort of uh, underbuild more to get the right kind of friction too because that is always something with with uh, gamification that 
it's not uh, necessarily lowering the thresholds as in as in UX and design. Maybe you should add some friction to the to the design as well. That makes a lot of sense. That's a very straightforward process, and I think it's something that most of us can apply. I won't say easily because in the end, the result and, and what you get from it is, is where all the work goes into, but easy to understand and easy to, to implement in that sense as well. So thank you. Thank you for that process, uh, Jan. Could, could I add something? Just, yes, please. Just a little to that. <laughs> Sorry, I get so excited about this. I, I want to add that to me, gamification isn't just a quick fix. It's a long-term strategy, as, a, as I'm sure you agree, Rob. But, but I want to stress this. If clients are looking for something like adding fun or a gimmick or even a game, that is probably not for me. Uh, fun might be, I think, a solution to some problems, but we need to know what the actual problems that we are trying to solve is about before we try to add the fun. Ad- otherwise, the fun might just be adding distractions, right? Absolutely. And then understanding the objectives are, is fundamental. And, and yeah. again, I, I completely agree with the whole strategy uh, side of this. And, and however, I just wanted to add a small thing as well, that it depends on what you're looking for, because your strategy could be, for example, one of the things that we do at, at the business school is we create learning materials for a session. So if your learning is for a session, that's not necessarily a strategic move in the sense that it's something that will be impacting them for years. It might be something sure. that impacts them for a few minutes, but it changes fundamentally what you're trying to look at. And, that, and that's, that's where it makes complete sense with what you've been saying as well. It's about the objective. What do you want to achieve and make it coherent with that? So you have to really figure out what are those things. So I completely agree, Jan, with, with what you're saying. And I mean, also, if it's a marketing campaign, it's a one hit wonder, it's, it's, it's fine. But if you are building a long time relationship or creating habits or stuff like that, you need to think about the, the long term strategy as well. Exactly. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. And now, Jan, we are going to move into this sort of second part of the interview where we were more into the, the sort of the quick answers and, and, and ideas that, that you might have, you might get when you, when you listen to these questions. And the first thing that we would like to know is if there's any sort of best practice or anything that you think almost any gamification project would benefit from from doing, from thinking about? Is there is there any such an element or idea that you would include in, again, almost any gamification project? Yeah, just what we've just been saying, I think. Uh, I mean, you should spend more time identifying the real problem that we are trying to solve. Don't try to be so quick to just find a solution, but really try to understand the problem. Does that make any sense? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> making Making sure that what you're what your solution you, you, you and again that this comes from a talk from Andrzej Marchewski as well last year in gamification europe in 2017 about solutioneering so don't look for yeah. <laughs> for a solution to a problem which still doesn't exist and maybe will never exist so you're you're designing a solution for something that is a problem and that makes a lot and of, of course, sense <laughs> yeah of course there are sometimes best practices but you always have to understand how to to address the problem i think exactly exactly and Jan, what would you say is your is your favorite game? Oh, that is really hard. I have like 10 favorite games. But if I had to pick one, it would be pinball, I think, for the maximum feeling of flow. <laughs> the, the pinball, the traditional one. Uh, yeah. You, the, you're the hitting pin- things. Wow. We, we actually, uh, I, I just arrived back from Gamification Europe when recording this interview. We actually had in the in the in the place where where the whole everything was happening, there was a pinball upstairs where where you could yeah. go and play during the conference as well. <laughs> so that that could have been very enticing for you, Jan. I'm sure next year we'll also have something similar. Yeah, <laughs> but but I also like uh, I mean I like concept games like Monument Value Valley Valley. It's called. It's not value <laughs> uh, <laughs> because of the atmospheric and mind blowing. I mean, this. Have you played it, Monument nope. Valley? It's for the iOS, I think. It's uh, like Escher-like, uh, you know, Escher who make this, he makes this uh, impossible staircases that goes around each other. Yes. Have you seen those paintings? Yeah. And, and like riddles where, with very nice music and stuff like that. So, so that is a fra- favorite as well. That sounds very, very interesting. 
And giving it a spin, is there anybody that you would like to listen to in an interview like this one in Professor Game? Yeah, actually, I have three names if okay. I can plug them all. Yeah. Uh, did you did you do Sebastian Dedering? Uh, we're in the process. Hopefully, it will be a future episode. So yes, yeah. sort of, but yeah. he hasn't been, so it's a very good request. Yeah, I think he's one of the sharpest tools in the box. Did a little work with him as well in a project. And since I am from Sweden, I would like to recommend two other fabulous Swedes, if I may. One is a, a brilliant colleague to be of mine at Insert Coin, where I'm starting uh, Saturday is my first day. But actually, I'm starting Monday. Adam, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask if, if Saturday was a thing in, in Sweden, because... <laughs> yeah, I, I can't wait to get, get going. But anyway, his name is Adam Palmquist. Uh, Adam Palmquist, he wrote this book, The Gamified Classroom. The first of its kind in Sweden. I, I think that would be straight up your alley, Rob. Yes, it sounds very, very interesting. I think the Palinquist is what sounds familiar. Um, okay. But I, if other than that, I'm not sure if I've heard of him before. And, and the, the, the book also sounds familiar, but I'm, I, I wouldn't put a face to that, to that name yet. Yeah, and also I would like to recommend Elin Nilsson at Umeå School of Business, Economics and Statistics. She holds a postdoc scholarship for a research on digital interaction, AR, social media and gamification in one. Uh, she is really super smart and really crisp around her approach. She is also a true advocate for gamification. And I think you could learn some new things and get fresh angles from her. So, so that is my third recommendation or a second suite. Anyway. <laughs> Sounds very, very, very interesting. And if you have, yeah. I'm guessing your colleague, will, you will be in contact quite frequently. And with this postdoc researcher as well, if you can help us get in contact, it would be a, a boost to, to get them in even, even faster. And I think that's what the field needs, more research. Uh, you, you had the Dr. Marigot Raftopoulos. Yes. Is that uh, the right pronunciation of her last name? She is, I think she is brilliant. She brings so much to the to the field with her research. Oh, you have to listen to or see her video at Gamification Europe. It was a full one hour keynote speech about her latest research. So you'll probably find it very enticing as well. I will. I will. Yeah. She she always has uh, what some would call a pessimist angle of what's going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think that is very important as well. We need to know what we're not doing right, or maybe not we yeah. as in each in, each one of us individually, but we as a as an industry, what we have to stay away from, what we would like to avoid as well. Uh, I think it's very important as well to have that, definitely have that perspective. Absolutely. From, and, and it's backed by research, so it makes a lot of sense. I mean, th this field has been criticized a lot, and we have to take that seriously. Uh, some We have to wash some of the... Bad, uh, bad wheel off, I think. I think we have to do it both from a research perspective and almost yeah. from a marketing pers perspective, I feel. I, I, I do think that when yeah. one thing, uh, just getting into complete tangent here that we haven't done as a field is um, use gamification to promote gamification. As a, yeah. Again, as a field, as this is something that you should be looking into if you haven't and why you should be looking into. And that's where I think also mm. research comes in because... There's a lot of science that's going on behind this, many good things that have been done, many, uh, and again, that's something else that I like to do in this podcast is bring successful examples of things that have been done. That's something else that we could also be adding into the, into the field. It's not only about people who are writing great books, but not everybody will get to read a full book about how gamification is great and how what are the results. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's sort of, I'm, I don't have the, the, the answer yet. I haven't even thought about it either, but I do think that there's an effort missing there. And maybe entities like the GAMFED, like Gamification Confederation yeah. could be one of the places to help out on that on that aspect. And I think what uh, what is happening right now in the in the community, adding more research like Lennart Nack and Gustav Tondello's research on the yes. user type Hexed, for example, and, and also, I'm joining this company now, Insert Coin, which, which is a Gothenburg-based company. Uh, my colleague Adam, which I was talking about, he is uh, uh, doing a uh, postdoc right now, doing research on our platform because we have a platform at Insert Coin. And I, I think we need to prove what we are doing. We need to be able to be exact about what we what we can achieve by by uh, I mean using data and, and analytics and stuff like that. Absolutely, absolutely. And and in that sense, uh, Jan, is there is there any book that you would like to recommend to an audience like like ours, like the Engagers? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have 
this one specific book i have a lot i have had a lot of practical use of uh, the sprint book are you familiar with it mm, i think but i'm not sure uh, it's uh, the Google Venture uh, guys, Jake Knapp, I think his name is, and, and another guy as well. They wrote this sort of uh, handbook for, for running a design sprint in one week from, from ideation to, uh, to a finished prototype that has been tested. I think it's a fantastic way to, I mean, just follow that book and you will have a, a perfect process of doing design and then add some gamification thinking to that as well. Fantastic. That's Sprint. That's a book. We will, again, you will always find all of these links and all these things that we've been mentioning in the show notes. So please feel free to go to, go to that, to professorgame.com, where you'll find all the show notes and details from this episode. And Jan, what would you say is your superpower when you're creating gamification? I think um, I should say... Um... Your, your sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, coming up with really weird ideas and out of the box ideas, Ide- ideas that maybe I am quite spontaneous when it comes to to designing when working in a team. Uh, but I mean, ideas that might seem a, a bit weird at the start, but in the end uh, tend to. I mean, when the rough edges have come off, adds. Uh, personality to a solution <laughs> and i'm sure you've learned a lot from your from your clown school as well and all that improvisation that comes that comes from that there's a lot of creativity that comes yeah. through from that so it's yeah and another superpower from th- from that that comes from that is i'm i'm really good at reading a room or a team and listening in and adjusting things i mean adjusting to the to the context i think that is another superpower so it sounds like a superpower of a speaker in a conference as well. So I hope to see you soon speaking in, in one of the conferences I attend to. I, <laughs> I, I hope to, Rob. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, we, we have still a few minutes left. And, and I would like to know uh, if you have any approach to, to this question from the audience. This question is coming from somebody called Attila Nagy. I hope you, I pronounce your name correct, Attila. Um, if not, please correct me. <laughs> And this person, Attila, says, I am a volunteer coordinator at an event organizer for NGOs, supporting people in need, dealing with waste management, reuse, etc. So his question is, what kind of gamification techniques can be used for motivating volunteers and supporters targeting possible investors? That's, if there are any good examples, what differences there could be between applying game design for a business versus an NGO, especially when, when talking about employees versus volunteers and supporters. Do you have an angle to that? Uh, oh, is that about putting pressure to the, to the, to the beneficiaries that are addressing? Or... I, I, would, I, I would interpret again, because I, I read you the question most, uh, mo- almost fully, is that he's talking about engaging the volunteers. So Engages sort of employee engagement, but with people who are there ah, for voluntarily. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think uh, the social mechanics are great when it comes to volunteers and I mean the meaningful aspect aspect to it. I mean giving some feedback both on what your peers are doing and, and what they think about things in this volunteering situation. I mean peer pressure and, and also I mean the, the, the purpose of doing this. It's a, it's a really good purpose and using the purpose – I've been involved in, in a gamification solution where we work with habits and, and, uh, and behavior around energy consumption behavior. And, and uh, I mean, repeating stuff and getting feedback about what you're doing and what, what kind of sense that makes in the big picture. That's fantastic. Thank, thanks. I'm, I'm sure Attila will be happy to have a lot more direction uh, as far as, as his question went. Finally, Jan, we're just about to finish the interview, but I don't want to let you go before first. If you want to have any final piece of advice, quick piece of advice for the engagers, then, of course, how can we continue to connect and engage with you, whether on social media, your webpage, let us know where we can find you. And then, of course, we'll say it's game over. Yeah. Uh, Any way you like, you can connect with me, I think. Uh, Google me, tweet me. I'm Jan Biedner, at Jan Biedner, at... uh, Twitter, but you can also drop me a mail at john at insertcoin.se. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, for all your insights, for all your expertise that you dropped here and left us a, a lot to, to think about and to use in our, in our future designs. Thanks for your time. 
But now it's time to say it's game over. Engagers, it's fantastic to have you here. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Jan. Are you using Instagram? I'm finally posting regularly and would love to connect with you there. Just like on Twitter, my username is at Rob Alvarez B. And before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know about fast learning and gamification? Then you have to listen to Keith Lillico next week. So subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.